message is titled, This is Jesus. And it is an answer to a question that was asked on that first Palm Sunday when Jesus was going into Jerusalem. The crowds were all around him and people were asking the question, who is this? And that is the question we're going to answer. Who is this man who dares enter Jerusalem at this time? He's not a king. He's not a political leader. He's not a rich man. He doesn't have so much, but he has the audacity to enter Jerusalem. Who is he? The text is from Matthew's gospel, chapter 21 and verses 9 and 10. And we read these words. Then the multitudes who went before him and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. This is Jesus. And that's my message for today. This is Jesus. The word Hosanna uh, is used frequently. Uh, even outside of Palm Sunday, people use it either to name a church or to declare uh, something in their lives. It's a Hebrew word meaning save now, save now, Hosanna, save now. And normally when people said Hosanna, they were making an appeal, they were crying out. And it was a cry of the oppressed, people who felt that they were pushed down, people who were oppressed, people who were disadvantaged. And at this time in Israel's history, uh, they were under Roman occupation. The Roman Empire had occupied Judea and Samaria, and the Jews were not feeling free in their own nation, so they were crying for a deliverer. And in their own mind, they thought the deliverer would be an army captain who would come and throw away the Roman Empire from off their necks. So, Hosanna is a cry of the oppressed. Oppressed people everywhere asking for salvation. Save now. Hosanna is also a cry for quick deliverance. It's not a, a cry for something to happen over a period of time or a process of time. When the people cried Hosanna, they meant save us now. Save now. Not tomorrow. Not next year. But save now. Now, and uh, in the days of Jesus, Hosanna meant different things to different people. For those of people, some, those, some of those who were crying Hosanna felt that Jesus was going to go into Jerusalem and throw away uh, the Roman uh, governor from Jerusalem. Uh, some thought that Jesus was going to overthrow the religious system, uh, but they, they felt Jesus was going to heal them. Uh, different people had different expectations when they said Hosanna. But the interesting thing you note here is the passage where they say that Hosanna in the highest. The Hosanna in the highest. In other words, they were saying Hosanna comes from the highest. And when they said the highest, they meant the most high God. The people understood that Hosanna only comes from God. Deliverance only comes from God. I believe the days of Jesus can be likened to our days. In those days, it was the Roman Empire. But in these days, especially in, the, in this first uh, uh, quarter of the year, in the last few months, it's been an oppressor we cannot see. And he's oppressing all alike. Oppressing the rich and the poor. Oppressing presidents and paupers. Oppressing black and white. Oppressing uh, age groups. Old and young. It's a virus. And all over the world people are crying, Hosanna. We may not use the words, but that's what the world is crying for. Hosanna. Hosanna. Save us. Deliver us. 
But whom are we crying our Hosanna to? In the days of Jesus, they cried to Hosanna to the son of David. But these days we are crying Hosanna and we don't know who should deliver us. Because science has failed us. We thought science had so advanced that they could snap their finger and all of a sudden a tiny little virus would be dealt with. But here with all our scientific development and advancement, we're able to look through galaxies light years away and we can't deal with a tiny virus in front of us. One of the reasons why people are anxious at this time is because we trusted in science. Hosanna to science. And science doesn't seem to know what to do. Governments have failed. We thought governments were very powerful. The government of the United States, government of Russia, government of China, the United Kingdom, Germany. These are supposed to be the rulers of the world. They know how to fix problems, but they can't. We cannot say Hosanna to government. We cannot say Hosanna to science. Wealth has failed us. People's money doesn't make any difference now. Even the church has failed. We cannot say Hosanna to the church. Because the church cannot save us. Science cannot save us. Government cannot save us. Money cannot save us. So whom are we crying Hosanna to? I think we have to learn from the first story. When they cried Hosanna, they didn't cry Hosanna to Pilate or to Caesar or to the Pharisees or to some powerful system. They cried Hosanna to a very unlikely person. His name was Jesus. Jesus, son of David. And who is he? They said he's a prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Remember when Jesus was introduced, the question was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The most unlikely personality. He has no government. He has no money. And yet he is the one they cried Hosanna to. He is the deliverer. Who is this? And they answered, he is Jesus. So the question I want to ask you today, as we remember this major historical occurrence in our Christian lives, is who is Jesus to you? Who is he? Jesus is many things. The people who cried said, Hosanna to Jesus, the son of David. He is sometimes called the son of God. He is sometimes also called the son of man. Quite a paradox. He is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the good shepherd. He is the bright morning star. He is the ancient of days. He is the fairest of ten thousands. You can Describe him in many ways, but who is this Jesus? So I'm going to talk about Jesus in four main ways. First, he is Lord. He is Lord. When Jesus was going into Jerusalem, he asked his disciples to go to a village and unloose two donkeys and bring them to him for him to ride on. And remember, this was a very important journey Jesus was taking. He didn't go on a horse. He went on a donkey. And that shows that although he was transporting himself, it was not in majesty, it was in humility. And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone of ask why you are losing these donkeys, tell them that the Lord has need of them. The Lord has has need of them. Jesus, who is he? He is Lord. The Greek word for Lord is kurios. And it means he to whom a person or things belong. He to whom a person or things belong. He is owner. Jesus is owner. He is the possessor and the disposer of a thing. He is the owner. He has full control. He is both the creator and the ruler of this earth. We think we own it. I think by now we know we don't own it. We think governments own the earth. We don't own it. 
A virus is teaching all of us we are not the owner. Science doesn't own it. Even the church doesn't own it. There is only one owner. He's God Almighty. And he is the owner. And Jesus is the son of God. He's both the creator and the ruler. The Bible says all things were made by him. And without him is nothing that is made. He's the word that created all things. He's popularly known as the Lord of Lords. His Lordship is above all Lords. He was Lord before he was born. He was Lord at birth because kings bowed to him. And prophets recognized him as at birth. He was Lord in his earthly ministry. Demons bowed to him. He was Lord even in death. He rose again from the dead. He's the possessor and disposer of things. Who is this? He is Jesus and he is Lord. He has servants who do his will. He has people who obey him. When we say that Jesus is Lord, we are saying he is the owner of us. He is our owner. And there are people who say Jesus is Lord just as a creed. But truly, when we say Jesus is Lord, it means we will go where he tells us to go. And he, we will do what he tells us to do. He has servants who do his will. And his purposes overrule all arguments. His purposes overrule all arguments. He said to them, if they ask you who said you should lose the donkeys, tell them the Lord has need of them. What God has need of overrules every restriction. God chooses whom he uses. He is Lord. He can pick you out of nowhere and do marvelous things with your life. He can choose you out of a multitude and pick you out and do marvelous things with you. He is Lord. His purposes overrule all argument. No argument or circumstance can overrule the purpose of God for your life. Not even a tiny virus that is perplexing everybody. That virus is not Lord. Jesus is Lord and he rules over viruses. He rules over destinies. He rules over governments. He rules over your life. He receives worship and honor and adoration. It's amazing what happened on that day when people spread their clothes on the ground for him to walk on. They saw him as their leader. They submitted to him. Isn't it amazing? Never stood for elections. Never became a big celebrity. Was from Nazareth of Galilee. Those towns and names may not mean too much to us. It's like uh, somebody storming Accra. Or somebody storming New York or London or any major metropolis. And bringing the city to a standstill. And everybody is asking... What's happening in the city? Why is the city in a standstill? They say, well, there's a guy who's entered town and, and, and oh, traffic is jammed. And where is he from? And we pick the name of a village somewhere in the backwaters of our country. And they say, well, that's where he came from, from that village. How could a village man, a village carpenter, now called a rabbi, bring the world to a standstill? His name is Jesus. He's the ruler. He's Lord. He's the owner. And he can shut down and he can open. He can bring everything to a standstill. And then he can say, let there be. Jesus is Lord. But that's not the only thing about Jesus. Who is this Jesus? He's a Lord, but he's also a servant. And that's the paradox about Jesus. He can be two opposites at the same time. He can be lion and lamb. He can be the beginning and the end. He is both Lord and servant. Jesus is not just one thing. He says, I am the alpha and the omega. He begins and he ends. 
He can be at both ends at the same time. He can be at the beginning and at the end. We have to travel from the beginning to get to the end. He is at the beginning and the end. He doesn't have to travel the distance. He's there at all times. He's the Alpha and the Omega. What he begins with you, he will end with you. And I want to declare to you, he will end well with you. And this year will end well with you. He who began with you will Omega you. He will bring you to the end. He is a servant and a Lord at the same time. He submitted his will to his father's will. Jesus was fully aware of what was in front of him in Jerusalem. When Jesus was going to Jerusalem, the people thought it was a party. Jesus knew what was ahead of him. He knew he was going to be crucified. He knew he was going to be tortured. He knew he would be betrayed. And yet he entered with audacity into that destiny. Now how would we have behaved if you knew you were going to enter a place and you had foreknowledge that when you enter the place, you will be killed? Would you go to that place? Would you enter? And if you entered, would you enter confidently? No reasonable human being would have done that. Jesus predicted, when I go to Jerusalem, I will be betrayed, I will be crucified, and I will be buried, but I will rise again. And yet he went to Jerusalem because he rules over all circumstances. And when his, his will was subjected to God, he was ready to trust God with his destiny. He left his throne and glory to come to us. The verse 5 says, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. Your king is coming to you. What a powerful statement. He's a king who comes to us. Normally, we go to the king. We go to the big man. But the passage says, your king is coming to you. In other words, instead of us looking for him, he is looking for us. Instead of us pursuing him, he's pursuing us. When he entered Jerusalem, he was looking for you. He was looking for me. He was looking for us. The king was on a search expedition. The king is looking for you. The king is seeking for you. The king is coming to you wherever you are. The king says you are so important. He's not waiting for you to come look for him. He's coming to look for you. He's a king who seeks for his servants. He is a shepherd who seeks for the lamb that is lost. He is the righteous holy one who seeks for the sinner. You know, many times when people look at people who are sinful, we look at them and say, you know, God will punish you and God will destroy you. We think God takes pleasure in destroying people. Especially people who disagree with us, people who insult us, people who say nasty things about us. Maybe somebody just unfairly treats you. And you, 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 your instinct is that because you feel hurt, God is hurt. And that because you, you feel bad, God feels bad. Just, just be, be careful not to equate your feelings with God's feelings. God's mercy towards people is beyond understanding. His mercy is so unimaginable. Remember Jesus was crucified and when they were driving the nails into his hand he said, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. They knew what they were doing but Jesus says, Father forgive them. They, they are ignorant people. Forgive them. God's mercy cannot be measured by your anger and your frustration and your fear. And just because you feel hurt doesn't mean God is hurt. God's mercy goes to the undeserved. He is a king who comes seeking for us. Seeking for the sinner. Seeking for the prostitute. Seeking for the drug addict. Seeking for the thief. Seeking for your enemy. Seeking for your boss whom you hate. Seeking for the friend you wish would be destroyed. But God is not seeking to destroy them. God is seeking to redeem them. Our Hosanna is to Jesus. And when he comes seeking, he comes to seek and to save that which was lost. Don't ever equate your anger with God's anger. He's a king 
who come seeking for the lost. Jesus is not only a king, he's also a prophet. He's a prophet. Verse 11, so the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. He approached his mission in the name of the Lord. Jesus carefully chose all his actions in line with prophecy. Everything Jesus did was choreographed to fulfill prophecy. His life was not lived haphazardly. Being a prophet doesn't just mean that he was telling people about their secrets. But being a prophet was that he knew the secret of God. He knew the purposes of God. And he lived to fulfill the purposes of God. And that's why they said he was a prophet. Because everything he did was prophetic. Even going into Jerusalem the way he did was in fulfillment of prophecy. He did everything well. He was a prophet. He knew the mind of God. He knew the will of God. And he acted in the will of God. His birth was prophesied. His life was prophesied. His death was prophesied. And his resurrection was prophesied. Jesus didn't live his life to chance. And I pray your life will be lived that way. That you will not live your life to chance. That you will not look at the circumstances you are living in and say, oh, everything is lost. No, we live our lives according to God's predetermined purposes. And God's word says, you shall not die, but you shall live to declare his glory. That's your word. You must live your life according to that. He gives his angels charge over you wherever you are. That's God's prophecy to you. He surrounds you with loving kindness. That's his word to you. Goodness and mercy shall follow you. That's his word to you. When God speaks to you, your work is to live your life in line. With the declared word of God. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus did. That's why he was called a prophet. Because he lived his life prophetically. And I believe that you will live your life prophetically. Yes, we've been surprised by what the world is going through. I didn't know it was going to happen. That's the honest truth. No clue. Clueless. You didn't know to. And anybody who says he knew, didn't know. Because if they knew, they would have prepared. Nobody was prepared. Nobody was prepared. That simply means that there are some things which God does all by himself. So the secret things belong to God. And the things that are revealed belong to us. And there are sometimes God hides truth from us. Or his purposes from us. And then reveals them later to us. But no matter what we didn't see. We see his word. We see his promises. We see what he says to us. And so all we do is latch our lives to the word of God. And make sure that everything we do is in line with the prophetic word of God. So you will live. And you will come through this. And you will have a testimony. Because that is what God is saying about you. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is servant. Jesus is a prophet. And finally, Jesus is a savior. Who is this? He is the savior. Hosanna, save us now. Did he save? Yes. He saves to the uttermost. Well, he didn't save them that on that day on the journey. But a week later, on a good Friday, they spread his arms, nailed him to the cross, crowned him with thorns, blood oozing out from the top of his head to the soles of his feet with nails in there. Every part of him with blood. Blood on his head, blood in his face, blood on his back, blood on his arms, blood in his sides, 
blood in his feet. He covered from the top to the bottom blood. But Jesus was not doing that for himself. He had the power to resist that. He did that because that act was a saving act. He was saving mankind from our top of the head to the soles of your feet. And that is why in this day, we can claim him as our savior. He's our savior from sin. He's our savior from sickness. He's our savior from our own mistakes, from our fallen nature. It's very interesting. After Jesus had gone through Jerusalem on that day, he entered the temple. And when he went, went to the temple, he cleaned up the temple. And after he cleaned up the temple, he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And the Bible says they brought to him the blind and lame to, for him to heal them. And he healed them. He is the savior. And today, if you want him to save you, he will save you. He will hosanna you. He will save you from sin. He will save you from your own fallenness. He will save you from your own mistakes. He will save you from sins you've inherited, sins you have committed. He will save you from your own bad temperaments. He's the savior. But he doesn't just save us only from sin. He saves us also from sickness. The Bible says by the stripes on his back, by the whipping he endured, by his back that was broken and torn, we are healed. We can claim healing. We can claim healing. And he will heal us. He saves us from a life of hopelessness. We can look into the future with great promise. Because he lives, we live also. And we can face tomorrow. I present to you Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He is servant. He is prophet. And he is savior. 2,000 years ago, he entered Jerusalem. Today, we welcome him back to the earth, to the nations of the world, from the North Pole to the South Pole, run about all the continents of the world. We welcome him into New York. We welcome him into Italy. We welcome him into Spain. We welcome him into Iran. We welcome him into Germany. We welcome him into Accra, into Lagos. We welcome him into Harare, Zimbabwe. We welcome him to Johannesburg. We welcome him to Cairo. We welcome him to Senegal, to Dhaka. We welcome him to every city that is plagued. Jesus, you are welcome. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. May you arise and ride into our cities, into our nations, into our families, into our homes, into our lives. And may you bring Hosanna to the world. And we mark this day as a day of Hosanna for the planet earth. The redemption will begin to flow in our nations. The redemption will begin to flow in our cities. The redemption will begin to flow in our countries. The redemption will begin to flow. Salvation will flow. Deliverance will flow. Help will flow. Life will flow. We speak to the nations of the world. Hosanna to the son of David who rides triumphantly to deliver us. And I pray for you that you will experience his Hosanna. His Hosanna, the son of David, the king of kings and the lord of lords will intervene in your life and bring you life. We speak over our nation, Ghana, and every other nation, that Christ, the same Jesus, the same Jesus will enter our cities and bring salvation. And deliverance. I want to just pray with you before I close my message for today. 
Because today is a very profound day. We join our hearts with Christians in all nations. Most of them shut down, locked down, listening to messages like this on the air and online. Presidents are doing it. Servants are doing it. Everybody equalized. But I trust that Jesus wants to enter your life. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, maybe you know a church or you know a pastor. You go to church and, and you do nice things and you do good things. And maybe you've gone to church all your life, but Jesus is not church. Jesus is bigger than church. Jesus is not religion. It's not how many times you've been to church or how much offering you give to church. Jesus is is the son of God and he has to be in your heart. Not your church in your heart. Not Pastor Otabel in your heart. Nor any other pastor. Is Jesus in your heart? Is he there? And if he is not, why don't you invite him? So bow down your heads wherever you, you are. And I'll lead us to pray a very simple prayer. And if you truly want Jesus in your heart, then pray this prayer with all earnestness. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I ask you, Father, have mercy on me. Save me. Save me. Save me. Jesus, Son of God, save me. Have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sins. Wash away my sins. Come into my heart. Live in my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. From today, I boldly proclaim Jesus is Lord and he lives in my heart. Thank you, Father, for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer earnestly with your heart, I believe God heard you and I believe that a new journey is going to begin in your life. And this same Jesus who 2,000 years ago wrote triumphantly will ride into your life and will make your life anew.